everybody. <laughs> Looked like Christmas puked up in here, huh? I like it. Oh, no. It's fine. It's going to be fine. Only because it's you. Am I already over it? Because I love you. Micah. You knocked over one of our Christmas trees. Oh, I thought you did. I'm just mess everybody. It's, whoa, see how the wife jumped in and like, Rawr. this is good. Guys, learn from this. Hey, I love it. I love it. Protection. There you go. That's why I got married to a redhead. She'll take you out. <laughs> hey, guys, if you have your Bible, James, James chapter 5. Um, nice little insight into marriage there. <laughs> James chapter 5 is where we're going to be this morning. Um, we're continuing our series um, in the book of James. We just have today and next Sunday, and then we're done with James. Oh, how awesome. Uh, it's been fun, and uh, then we'll get into a quick little Christmas series. And then, um, I know, I know, they, me too. That's the noises I make when I think about Christmas. Um, but uh, really excited to finish up James here and, and, and be diving in. I'm really excited about this particular passage. I want to pray for us as, we, as you turn there and uh, we jump in. Jesus, um, I'm so thankful that we got to spend time this last week um, thinking through and being um, great, um, thinking through gratitude and thanksgiving for the, I pray for the things that, um, that you have done in the lives of of these young people and their families and and God, even in a in sometimes stages of life where we we don't even know how to be thankful or grateful, God, I, I ask that you may get our hearts there and our minds there. And now we get to kind of turn into that season, continue in Thanksgiving, as we are just so grateful and so thankful, God, for sending your Son, um, wrap them in flesh, and send them here to Earth to live a perfect life, to teach. Um, perfect teachings, but then eventually to um, go to the cross and and do the work of the cross, Lord. And so now as we continue to go through James, may we be reminded of the good news um, in our hearts and our minds, and may out of that reality um, we learn this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever felt taken advantage of? <laughs> right? Like, one of the biggest ways that that happens, especially in the teenage world, is like when someone starts talking about you at school and it's like so off or maybe there's just a small glimpse of truth, but it's been completely twisted and gossip begins about you among friends or among a school and you there's literally nothing you can do about it. Like at least you feel like you can go to different people and try to like make the wrong right, but eventually it could like spread like a wildfire and you're like, I'm just like a sitting duck here. There's nothing I can do. Like that's one way of feeling um, taken advantage of. How about suffered? You ever suffered? Anything happened in your life or things that you've gone through? Maybe uh, it may not be suffering some, for someone else or somebody who like maybe like starving because they can't eat. But in your world, for you, man, it feels like suffering. How about cheated? Like you felt like you deserved something or you felt like it should have gone a certain way. But man, life threw you some curveballs and you feel cheated. The, the, the people that James is speaking to are going through different waves of these types of realities and these types of thinking. Now, it may not be the exact same suffering and feeling cheated that you and I go through every day. Now, James is speaking to a people. But you and I can read this book and read these passages and take something out of it. So just because it was written to a people, it doesn't mean that us, the people of God, can't receive truth from it as well. And so it may be different, but the people are go that he's speaking to are going through. It's the church that is scattered, that is being persecuted, that is being taken advantage of, that are wanting vengeance in, in moments in their lives, and they're struggling. James has not forgotten that. So even in the midst of him encouraging them of the gospel, with the gospel and telling them how to live, James doesn't forget that. And he's about to give a nod to that here in the first part of chapter five. So when you read these first uh, six verses, understand this. We just spoke to the wealthy believer who is talking about, hey, I'm gonna go to this city and to that town and I'm gonna plan and make all these plans. And he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Don't do that. The will of God needs to be at the center of everything that you do. 
So he's encouraging them. But now he makes a shift to non-believing wealthy, those who are sadly walking out in evilness. And it's not only is he speaking to these people, but he's giving a nod to the church and, and saying, I under, listen, I understand. And guess what? God is still at the center of this and he's with you. So here's where it goes. Chapter five, verse one. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotten and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and the corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remained steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under the condemnation. There's a lot here that we're gonna unpack. So just keep up. And if you have a question, raise your hand. I probably won't pick on you, but um, I'll try to answer it. We'll get there. <laughs> raise it more than, to, than once and maybe we'll stop. Okay, so here's what's happening. Right at the beginning, verse one through verse six, like I said, it's as if, if I'm writing you a letter and you're feeling this suffering and you're feeling this cheating and you're feeling like you're going through... Um, all this persecution, it's like, a, it's like a tip of the hat and a nod of like, let me tell you what's gonna happen to these people who don't follow God. And guess what? Also be careful because you can fall under that as well. And so he comes in with some harsh language. I mean, look at that first verse. Come now you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Whoa, like right off the bat, he's already telling them hell's coming for you. Like it's not gonna be pretty. It's, it's, there's gonna be misery there. And in fact, all the riches that you're about, all the things that you, that you try to, uh, um, to um, use as material, materials that you're after on a daily basis, those very things that you're building here on earth, the kingdom that you're building here on earth, those very things that you're all about, you're not about God, you're about these things, are actually gonna be the things that are gonna be used against you. They're not just gonna burn and go away forever, meaning they're not even gonna, you're not gonna be able to take them to the next life with you. They're actually gonna be used as evidence against you because of the sins that you committed against God. Here's what's crazy. Anybody go out for Black Friday? Anyone? Okay, yeah, I went out, was it on Friday? Yeah, I went out on Friday as well. Was it Friday? Yeah. Anyway, I, the days, guys, over Thanksgiving just kind of became one, right? It's like turkey and ham and Black Friday. Uh, so you got Black Friday, and now it's not even Black Friday anymore, right? It's like Black Thursday and Wednesday and Saturday. We got Cyber Monday, Cyber Monday coming. I mean, we live in a world of materialism. I mean, mater like we want stuff, right? And Christmas is coming, right? And we get all of a sudden into these urges like, what do I deserve? What are my parents gonna get me? What should they get me? What if they get me this, but really I want that? And like something can well up within us, even as believers, like, and you're like fighting within, within inside of you. And right here, James is, is right hitting them right in the face. You are materialistic people, and you think that these things that you're working for and you're building up here on earth are, are, are enough. But in reality, you know what? These things are actually gonna be used against you one day. These are the things that are gonna condemn you. These are, this is gonna be the evidence that's gonna be used against you. They, 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 they're gonna burn. Your gold and silver have corroded and the corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. Whoa. Like he's coming at them. Pretty good here. You have laid up treasures in the last days. 
Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud. Again, if I'm James and I'm talking to this group of non-believers, these, these, these wealthy people who are landowners, they probably own most of Galilee, right? And so a lot of these believers who are listening to this letter probably worked for these people, right? Again, if I'm speaking to this person and you're listening in or to this group of people and you're listening in, you're probably like, yeah, James, get them, right? But He's doing a, a purpose here of, of calling out what's really happening around them, the evilness that's happening around them. And instead of giving in and walking just in that evilness, he's actually saying, hey, hold on. God is actually hearing you. Because look, later on in this verse, he says this, are crying out uh, these people that you're, you sinners are uh, hurting and um, keeping back by fraud. They're crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts, meaning this, if again, if I'm speaking to this group of people who are being evildoers in the time of the church, I'm calling them out. I'm calling out where, what's actually gonna happen to them if they don't surrender to God. And at the same time, as the, as the church is listening in, they should feel encouraged, not only that they are walking in righteousness and following God, but at the same time that God actually hears them. See, if they're being persecuted and they're hurting and they're wandering and wondering, what God are you up to in this moment that feels so tough where I feel like I'm just always losing? Do you even hear me? And right here, as he is preaching to this group of, of people, he's saying, God hears you. In fact, he's warning the evildoers. You know what? The Lord of hosts hears his people. And it's, a, it's, a, it's like a, it's a tip of the hat to the believer, like you're not alone. God actually hears your prayers. God actually knows and understands your suffering. He is with you. He's for you. This is pretty intense right here. And I wanna make a, 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 a quick note of this in verse four, where it's talking about, um, again, he's talking to these, these, um, these wealthy people who own all this land. He's saying, behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, would you kept back by fraud? Okay, imagine not only being part of the poor crew and being uh, oppressed by these wealthy people, but also once you do the labor, once you do the work, which you don't probably get enough wages anyway, in order for me to not pay you well, I, I lower your word. I convince those around me that you've committed fraud, so therefore I don't have to pay you the way you should be paid. So it's like insult on top of insult. It's, the, these wealthy people were evil, the things that they were doing. Not only, like I said, were they like all about self-indulgence and, and luxury and, and uh, materialism, but also they're like, I'm gonna step on these people on top of them already being poor. It's, it's, it was awful and, and, they could sense, and they could sense it and James had to speak to it. Five, you have lived on earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. Meaning that these guys and these women who are walking in this type of life, they, like their own calf that are just eating, eating all the way up to the slaughter. They don't even know, they're just hungry. They're just eating on the way there. They're doing the same thing in life. You're on the way to your slaughter and you're filling yourself with all this luxury and materialism. For what? Ultimately, you're gonna die. Six, you have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. I love this passage because there's a double meaning. So if you wanna underline anything right now, you can underline that righteous person. There's a double meaning there. One of God's forgiven people and a person who is innocent of the death sentence that the wealthy have been handing them over. So he, as he's talking to these wealth, this wealthy group, he's telling them, hey, you know what? These righteous people, righteous before the eyes of God because of what Jesus did on the cross, but also righteous because, uh, because they're innocent of the fraud that you're accusing them of. You know what they do? You know what they do? They do they, he does not resist you. They don't resist you. This is kind of giving a tip back to Matthew 5, where it talks about like, hey, man, if you get slapped on one side of the face, turn, turn, turn it right over and, and let them slap you on the other side. Does that mean go out there and just find people to stomp all over you? No, there's situations that are gonna happen in our lives that we step into that sometimes you're gonna feel like you got the short end of the stick. And instead of going after vengeance, is backing up 
and not getting into this resist mode and letting God be the one who does the work there. God will have his vengeance. You must understand that. And this is again, if the church is listening in on this letter, as James is coming after this group of people that are hurting these believers and even non-believers out there that are hurting the poor, they're listening in and saying, yo, God is for you. He hears you. He will have his vengeance. You don't need to sit, lean into this resistance thing of like, we're gonna, we're gonna build this army and go against these wealthy people because they're hurting us. And let me tell you, especially growing up in our culture, we will up that way, right? We find a cause, we get after it. We, we, need to, we need to overcome it. We need to defeat it. Am I against causes? Absolutely not. I think that there's a time and place for certain things to speak up. Absolutely. But in this space, in this place, what the people of God should be hearing and learning and what James is saying is God hears your cries in the midst of your suffering. God hears your cries in the, me- in the midst of you feeling cheated. God hears your cries in the midst of you feeling like you would, it, vengeance just wants to weld up in you. And instead of leaning in and trying to fight that fight, lean back and let God take care of you because he will. He's got your back. James is telling him he's not forgot, even though I'm teaching you all this stuff and asking you to walk in certain ways because of the truth of the gospel, God has not forgotten that you are suffering and you are struggling. He's got you. And so it's like right here at the end of this passage of six, it's he makes this shift. So again, if this group of wealthy people, if I'm James and you're the church listening in and I'm talking to this group of people, I want you to listen into this conversation for a few reasons. One, to know that God is for you. I'm almost like speaking for God. Hey, I got you because these people are actually walking into a terrible place. Don't actually give in and become like them. Don't do that. And also don't seek your own vengeance. And also guess what? God is hearing you. So as I'm having this conversation and and letting you listen in, those are the things that you should be taking away. And then right at the end of that passage, it's like I'm shifting over to speak to the church. And he says this. So according to what you just heard, be patient, he says. Be patient. I know you're squirming in your seats. I know you, like a few verses ago I talked about, if I'm I'm James, I know like a few verses I just talked about, you wanna take control. You wanna do all the planning. You wanna get it over with and and put God on the sidelines. I I get it but you gotta be patient. And I know that's the last thing you wanna hear as the, as the church that's scattered and is suffering and is struggling. And I know that's the last thing you wanna hear as teenagers. <laughs> like, just give me the answers, Arnold. But it's saying on here, be patient. Therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord, see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives their early and the late rains, you also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. He uses an example, right, of the farmer, right? I don't know if I would have the patience to be a farmer. Let's just be honest, right? This idea of like dirt, seeds, water, stare. Pray. Hope rain comes, <laughs> especially in California, right? Holy cow, right? Like rain, are you ever gonna come? It's just hot all the time. But this patience, right, um, right now, Christmas trees are through the roof, like crazy expensive. Why? Because the rains were bad years in the last few years, right? Because they always have to plan years ahead, right? Imagine that business right now. You're like having to think years and years ahead. And the patience is absolutely necessary. The dependence on good weather is absolutely necessary. The dependence on the market being okay. I mean, I'm telling you, I don't want to be a farmer right now. (laughs) But this is the example that James goes to to represent patience. And then I love this because it goes back and gives a nod to the very beginning of of, of his book where he says this, be patient. Instead, you wanna focus on something? Oh, this is so good. You can underline this too. Establish your hearts. Oh boy, let's go back establish your hearts. The very first sermon I gave about James was at the beginning and at the end and in the middle. If your heart isn't in line with the truth of God, you already lost. You're already behind. Your heart must lean in and be rooted in truth and love. 
That's what we talked about the very first time we opened up James together. We have to start there, that your heart should build roots in the gospel, in the truth of who God is, in the truth of who Jesus is, and lean into that. And outside of that, begin walking your life in step with the Spirit. That's where we started. And here James goes back and gives, gives a nod to that once again and echoes that. Be patient. And in your patience, you know what you should be focusing on? Continue to establish that heart of yours, depending on God, leaning in on the Lord. His truth, what you know to be truth about him, which he's gonna talk about a little bit later in this passage. You know his purposes. You know what they are. Don't let the world tell you otherwise. Don't let your emotions or something that you went through this week or somebody, something someone said or a moment you went through, don't let that derail you in such a way that your heart is off track. Be patient. Let God deal with the things that God is gonna deal with. Because let's be honest. Let's go back to the first question. If you've ever felt taken advantage of or like you wanted vengeance or you wanted to take matters into your own hand, really, really, what are you gonna accomplish with that, one? And two, can you, can you actually control the outcome? We can't, yet we try to fight that fight. What? And it's just double loss because you put in all this effort and all these things and all this pain that can come out of that and all this emotion for what? Let God take care of the things he is supposed to take care of and you take care of the things you're supposed to take care of. And he's saying, hey, establish your heart, lean into his truth, continue to grow, continue to learn, remember his purposes, understand that he's with you and keep moving forward. And I love how he says this. Do not grumble against one another, brothers. So basically, you're already walking this out. You're going to need each other. So enough. But how do you talk about one another? How do you speak to each other? How do you build each other up? There is this theme that goes on through the, through the, through the book of James. For, to James, our words matter, man. What we say matters to him. Like, and I believe, again, is another nod to the heart. Because out of your heart, the overflow of the mouth speaks. That's what's, whatever's going on in here, we're gonna hear it. That's what's gonna come out. And so here again, he's saying, hey, establish your heart. And in the midst of that, easy, easy on how you speak to each other, easy on how you treat one another. Stop breaking each other down, dressing each other down with words and hurting each other. Like you don't matter. No, build each other up. And then he gives another example. He gives an example of Job and he gives an example of, of the prophets. Ha, <laughs> Listen, I know you're suffering. I know you're struggling. I know, you know, today is what? The 28th? November 28th, 2021. Could be a tough day for you. Maybe tomorrow will or, some, or the next day. But in the midst of that, remember those who have gone before us who were steadfast, he says. They stood strong. Their hearts were established. Look to the heroes of the faith. That's what he's saying. When you're feeling low and you're feeling like you can't get through it and you're feeling like it's too hard to be a Christian, which sometimes, let's be honest, it can be that way, right? Like I, I, people who say like, oh, you just use God as a crutch. Really? Have you tried to be a Christian? <laughs> it's not easy. Trust me. I feel like many times I, I convince myself it would be so much easier to not be a Christian right now. <laughs> And what I want to say to this person, <laughs> how I want to seek my own vengeance, how I want to go do my own thing, right? It's not easy. And I'm not saying, ooh, whoa, poor you. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying James gets it. God gets it. And he's with you and he's for you and he sees you. He continues in this passage right at the end of uh, verse uh, 11 after he gives these examples of the prophets and Job who, who stood steadfast, he says, he reminds us um, right at the end, and you have seen the purposes of the Lord. Guys, um, I can't remember the name of the song right now because it's escaping me, the hymn that goes, um, in the hour that I first believed. Amazing Grace. Come on now. Thank you. 
It happens, brain farts. But like, I love that line, right? Remember the hour that you first believed? You remember? You remember that moment? Go back to it for a second. Like, remember the, remember the reasons that you leaned into God? You remember the moment where your heart and your, and your mind connected in such a way that you're like, yes, this is it. This is truth. God had so much grace on your life that he presented himself to you, the good news in such a way that it clicked and you leaned in and you began to see that there was purpose to life. You weren't just floating around like nothing. And as James is saying, remember the purposes of the Lord. You saw them, you know them, you know the call. Some of you got to hear it from like directly from us who heard it directly from him. You've seen his purposes, you've seen his work. Don't forget that. Let that encourage you in those worst days where you don't even wanna get up, man. And you rather just sleep in because everything around you you feel has cheated you or you want vengeance or you feel hurt by life or others, whatever. And in those moments, remember the truth of the gospel, that he is for you, he is with you. He's done the heavy lifting. He's done the hard work. Because look at this at the end of that passage, how the Lord, remember this, not only his purposes, but remember how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. We forget that. We forget that he actually understands what you're going through. He gets it. Because he's gone through it 10 times fold, 10 times over. He gets it. He understands your pain, your worst day, where you think God doesn't even live in 2021. He does not understand what I'm going through. He's never lived through COVID, so how could he get it? <laughs> like, listen, he understands your space, your time, your situations, your pain. And the, and the scripture says he has compassion toward you. He has mercies for you every day. And he's gonna back you. He's gonna walk with you all because of the work that he did on the cross. Not because you're awesome and you figured it all out, but because he's awesome and he's figured it all out. He says, and I choose you. I choose to walk with you. I'll end with this passage, which I think, again, gives another just echo and nod to this idea of the heart and of our words. He says, but above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by the other or, or any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. What I love here is, again, we can see this as like the beginning of the end of his letter, like he is when he says, but above all, or just another nod to this like taming of the tongue, okay? He's been talking about the importance of your words. What do you say to one another? What do you say to others? And here's another point pointing to it. Back in that day, it was a lot of, you know, I swear by the Lord, I swear by heaven, I swear by Israel. These were the types of things that were said. Why? Have you ever, have you ever sworn by something? Like, I put it, bro, for real, I put it on my mom. You know, it's like, wait, what? Don't do that, right? Or like, like I swear by my life or I swear by my friend's life, which is just rude. Um, but like, have you, like, you've ever gone to that point or you've ever heard somebody say that? The reason they do that is because they don't believe that their word is sufficient enough. So they take on somebody else's credit, who they may be, and they put it on their word. And this is what people did in that time. What they would swear on was the Lord, or they would do an oath. You know, I mean, and, and, and if you go read Ecclesiastes 5, take, take some time, go in there at some point, and what the Lord has to say about uh, making an oath. To you, it may just be something you said randomly, but to him, he heard you. He's gonna keep you to it. So instead, he says, don't, don't do that. <laughs> don't go there. It's almost like using God's name in vain. So let's get that out of there. And what James is encouraging is he's saying, hey, live in such a way that your heart is established in, in the truth 
that what comes out of your mouth carries weight. So when you say something, you actually mean it and you follow up with it. And your yes means yes and your no means no. And you have such a, a character about you and such integrity about you that when you say something, people believe it and they, and they, and, and they honor it and they take your word as oak. It's strong, it's legitimate, it matters that you don't have to go take on somebody else's credit to place on, on top of yours. And you know why I think, because to me, James is all about the gospel. <laughs> you know why I think he says that? Look at the last part. Not so that you may not fall under condemnation. Let me go back to what these people, these wealthy people were doing. Remember that whole idea of fraud, right? What does fraud mean? Fraud, it, it, it basically, if you're accused of fraud, it means that you, you have lied your word is definitely not taken as truth and that you have created or done something to cheat something, right? That's a very general idea, right? So there, this is why the wealthy people are being so evil. Not only am I just gonna step on you poor people and live, live in my own luxury, but I'm going to uh, discount your word itself. Your word means nothing. And you're gonna be accused of things that you didn't even do. And you're gonna have to put up with that and deal with that. I believe that James is like, hey, live in such a way that you can't even be accused of fraud. Like it may still happen in the courts and things going on out there, but at the end of the day, your word is so real, it's so true, you can't be condemned. And not only that, again, because James is about the gospel, who are you going to believe? Someone whose yes is yes and no is no, and then they present the gospel to you? or someone whose yes is a no and no is a yes and they present a gospel to you. Which one? I'm gonna go toward this guy or this girl right here. Why? Because the way that they speak, the, the, they, they follow through with what they say. And how does that translate all the way down to you and me? Oh boy, here we go, ready? How many of us say we're gonna be somewhere and we don't show up on time? Did I touch something? Sorry. Hey, I'm going to be there at 10 o'clock. And you show up at like 10, 15, 10, 20, 10, 30. And sometimes, hey, things happen and we get it. But then you do it again. And then again. And then again. And before you know it, you know what the joke happens? Ha. Huh. That's just so and so. Oh, you don't want people saying that. You don't want people saying, oh, that's just so-and-so. They say they're gonna do that, but they really don't do that. It's fine. Like, because they love you and they wanna care for you and still be friends for you, they start justifying your word. They start justifying when you say yes, it's a no, and when you say no, it's a yes. They start justifying in their mind so that you guys can continue in relationship and connecting with one another because maybe, just maybe, your friend has tried to tell you something and correct you and like, hey, are you going to do what you said you were going to do? Because it's, it's not looking good for you. And showing up on time is one thing, or, or saying that you're going to be committed to something. And you even say it, or maybe you even post it. Oh, boy. And you don't follow through. What does our word mean? James is calling us out right here, in my opinion. Let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. What you say matters. It'll, let it carry weight. Follow through. Will we be perfect? No. Then we can use the same mouth to go back and ask for forgiveness. Praise God. <laughs> right? But then, hey, try to sharpen that up. Many times as teenagers, you get hit hard with this truth. It's like, they're just teenagers. They're just, wait, what is your generation called now? Why? Z, I don't know. One of the alphabet letters. <laughs> You're just Generation Z. And a few years back, it was, oh, there's just millennials. You just, that's how they act. No, uh, that's not what that's saying. It doesn't say, let your yes be yes, your, your no be no, but unless you're millennials or Generation Z, you're good. What? No. Your word matters because 
your word is an outflow of what's going on in your heart. And James is continuously calling us to establish our hearts in the gospel, always. He's always gonna take us back there. And my hope for you is that this will be a lesson for all of us, especially as young people and you're going into the business world, college or whatever. May your word carry weight because the weight behind it is the gospel. And that is weighty, man, in a beautiful way. Because you speak for God. Ain't that crazy? Go back and read the scriptures. I'm always blown away when we're called the uh, ambassadors for the Lord and for the gospel. I don't get it. I'm like, God, for real? He's like, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use you and I'm gonna use your life and I'm gonna use your words. All right then, let your yes be yes and your no be no. We gotta start there so that people will then trust to hear you and they don't just condemn you and be like, nah, man, I can't even believe you because you can't even show up on time when you said you would. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for your truth. Go with us now this week and use the scriptures, use this truth to speak to us, even just be a small piece. Thank you for the family that we have here. In your name we pray, amen.